and get Joseph to pull that PowerPoint up for us, please, sir, and hit, hit that record button. It's been a hot week, has it not? Yeah. It's been a little warm outside. Uh, not that I would know. I spent most of my days uh, actually under a blanket watching television with my granddaughter this week on the couch, so not a lot of outside time. But we walked outside to the park yesterday that's in our neighborhood, and as when we got there, I suddenly realized if we go down those slides together, we may not have all our skin when we get done. So we walked home back home. It's been a little warm. It's been a little warm. But not anywhere near the record it was last summer, I don't believe. So Richard Rogers, one of my uh, teachers at Sunset, said that at one point when he was the preacher there at the Sunset Church in, in Lubbock, he preached the same sermon 12 weeks in a row. Slightly different variations on it, but he preached basically the same sermon 12 weeks in a row. And he said it wasn't until week eight or nine that somebody actually came up to him and said, hey, that sounds like the same sermon. Are you going to do anything new and different? To which he responded, as only Richard can. He said, if it was good enough for God to preach it over and over again, it's good enough for me to preach it over and over again. So I think that's where we are in, in 1 John. I, I seem to be, in my mind, I, I seem to keep saying the same sermons and, and, and coming up with the same illustrations over and over again. But when you, when you read through 1 John, that's the situation. He keeps bringing up the same topics over and over again. Richard went on to explain to us in class that, that the reason, he believes, that God kept preaching the same sermon over and over again, and if you don't believe that, look at the prophets, the minor prophets and the major prophets. The, the, the message is continually that God is gracious, that people need to repent from their evil ways, return to God and be saved. And if you don't, then, then destruction is certain. John is preaching over and over again to this audience. He said, don't leave what you already know. Don't leave the salvation that you have in Jesus Christ and chase after this false religion that's come into your world. Don't do that. Stay Remember that God is gracious. Repent of your evil ways. Return to God and be saved. If you don't, destruction is certain. As we look at beginning chapter 5, this week and next week will probably be the last two sermons that we have in 1 John. We're going to take off a rather big chunk of Scripture here this morning. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. We're going to hear again this same message and, and, and see if you can hear it with a slight variation. He begins this way, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. His commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus, the Messiah. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And if it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. We accept human testimony. But God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God, which He has given about His Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. 
I think John is telling us, if we look, if we dive into this text, he's going to use the word victory. And when I think of the word victory, I think of the word conqueror. John is reminding his audience that they are conquerors. Paul will say that we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ in the, in the Roman letter, I believe. But here John is reminding us again that with all of this stuff that's going on in the world, with all these things that are trying to pull you away, with all of the, these false teachers and all of, the, all of the life that keeps getting thrown at you and your temptations to walk away from it, he says, I want you to understand God sees you as victorious. You are a conqueror. Not on your own through the works of Jesus Christ. And he reiterates that. He tells them again that they are vic victorious, that they are conquerors. And he does that in three different ways, I think. He breaks it down into three different sections here. The first one is going to be joyful obedience. We see some joyful obedience here in the first three verses of chapter 5. John begins with the truth that he has established from the beginning of his letter. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Messiah has been born of God. You see, the false teachers were denying that Jesus was the Christ, that he was the Messiah, that he was indeed the Son of God. And John's not merely speaking about what the person claims with his mouth, but he's also talking about the confession that leads to life change. When we say out loud with our mouth, it's one thing to say, oh, I believe in Jesus. It's another thing to live as if you believe in Jesus. He says, everyone who loves the Father also loves those who are born of God. And if you go back to chapter 4, that pretty much summarizes the whole, the whole thing. If you love the Father, you're born of God. If we love God, then we will be loving our Christian brothers and sisters. Look how he words it here in, in chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. And then he just reverses that. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. Do you want to know how you love the children of God? By carrying out his commands. It's usually the other way around. Do you want to know how you love God? By loving his children and carrying out his commands. Here he says, do you want to know how you love God's children? by obeying God and following His command. I love how he just he, he brings out the same point. Again, it's the same sermon over and over and over again because we need it. I need it. Because you see, when I hear the same things over and over again, sometimes it gets lame and sometimes I get tired of it. But you know what it does for me? It grounds me. It sticks my feet in the ground and gives me something solid to stand on. And so when John again tells me time and time again that th this, these things about God, I'm going to plant my feet on that solid ground. He says that we love God, we love His children, and when we love God and obey His commands, that we can't have one without the other. You can't say you love God and have hatred for your brother. Remember he said that in the chapter before. You can't say, I love God, whom you've never seen, and say, I hate my brother, whom you have seen. He said, you can't do it. You're making yourself out to be a liar. It's impossible to truly love the children of God without loving God also. Now, we're not going to deny ourselves for the gain of each other if we do not truly love love God. I'm not going to deny myself so that you can be better. You're not going to deny yourself so that I can be better if we don't truly love God. To be in a relationship with God, to be in a relationship with God's people suggests to me that we need to understand and truly understand and truly follow loving God. Loving each other. John, I think, is saying that loving God is, is, is not just saying that we love God. It's not just trying to find an experience or an emotion toward God. That loving God is following His commands. He says there, remember what he says? This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out His commands. <laughs> now, His commands, he says 
are not burdensome. In verse 3, we use the word heavy here, weighty. The word, the Greek word is barus. It, it means f literally heavy. This stand has weight to it. It's heavy. It is a burden if I try to pick this up and carry it around all day. That's the figurative part of it. Literally, or, or excuse me, that's the literal part of it. The, the figurative part is it's pressing down. It's an oppressive force. It's something that's weighing down on you and causing you to not have freedom to move. God's commands do not weigh down on us. They do not press on top of us and weight us down to the point that we can't move. God's laws for us, God's commands for us, take the burdens off and give us the ability to love people that we may not understand how to love or that we may have never loved or, on our own. To love Him the way that He loves us, to sacrifice for Him the way that He sacrificed for us. He says, Paul, John says, this, this command to love one another, to love God, with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, is everything you've got. That's not a burden. That's not something that weighs you down. That's not something that sucks the life out of you. It's something that puts life into you. As a parent, when we assign chores, we don't tell our four-year-olds to go out and wash and wax the truck. That's a burden. They can't do that. We don't tell our 10-year-olds, go out and put a new roof on the house. We wait till they're 11. Come on now. As earthly parents, we, we try not to put heavy burdens on our children, oppressive commands on our children. And we shouldn't command them to do things that we don't show them how to do. And God doesn't say, I want you to love one another, and you guys figure it out. He says, love one another the way I have loved you. Jesus will tell his disciples that. Serve one another the way I've served you. Live for one another the way I've lived for you. Love one another the way I've loved you. Die for one another the way that I am dying for you. He doesn't give us a command that's burdensome. He, he hasn't shown us how not to accomplish it. Or how to, he, he hasn't refrained from showing us how to accomplish it. He accomplished it through Jesus and John, in this whole epistle talking about the love of God, he says to love one another. Love is from God. God is love. God has shown his love in the atoning sacrifice of his son, Jesus, Messiah. John reminds them following God is not a burden. Some of the teachers there may have been putting burdens on them. Well, if you want to follow this form of teaching, then you've got to do this, 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 and this, and this. Things that you'll never be able to accomplish. Some of the world's religions today, some of the, some of the world's largest religions today put conditions on if you want to be a this, then you've got to do this. And they make it impossible. They don't show you how to do it. God says, here's what I, here's, here's, we're going to keep it simple, stupid, the K-I-S-S method. We're going to keep it simple. Love me. Love your neighbors. The two commands that sum up everything love me, love your neighbors. And man, we have really messed that up in this world, have we not? He moves on into verses 4 and 5, and he talks about being victorious and having a victorious faith. Let's read verses 4 and 5 together again. For everyone born of God overcomes the world, overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes, who has faith, that Jesus is the Son of God. John spent quite a bit of time proving in previous chapters that we are born of God, that those who are walking in the light, loving God, loving one another, are born of God. 
Therefore, when we overcome the world, because we have been born of God. We have overcome the world. Now, he's not talking about the Olympic Games like we were talking about earlier today. He's not talking about you're on a team, a basketball team, and you've overcome the opponent. He's not saying that. He's not talking about that. He's talking about the world. When he talks about the world, he's talking about sin. He's talking about the ways of the world. You are victorious over the ways of the world. You have overcome the sinful ways of of the world. If you are born of God, not and, and again, not if you are born of God, because you are born of God, you have overcome the ways of the world. And he says we do this by faith. How have we overcome the world? Our faith. Hebrews chapter 11 Verse 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Simply put, at least for me, it's trusting in something that you cannot explicitly prove. Okay, and I want to define that a little bit further. When we talk about faith, we, it, it, I, I think it really comes down to two different aspects. That it's an intellectual assent, meaning it's something that I believe. Uh, this chair, let's use this chair for an example. I believe this chair, I believe that this is a chair. I believe this designed for me to sit in that chair. I, I, I believe that's a chair. My brain says that's what you're supposed to sit in. The trust part is relying on the something that I believe in to be true. I believe that if I sit in this chair, it's weight's going to hold me. Here's the trust part. Here's the faith part. It did it. It did it. Now, Let's put that into the spiritual realm. I believe who Jesus is. I believe who the Bible says Jesus is, that he is the Son of God. I believe that he came to earth and he took away my sins. I believe that. Trusting is saying I believe in the something. I'm giving him everything. It's like me sitting in that spiritual chair. I'm going to sit with Jesus. Now, we all know this physical chair, because it's in the physical realm, can, can break and fall. We, we've all experienced that. And as much as I may want to put my faith and trust in that chair, at some point that chair could let me down. Isn't that right, Jim? That chair could let me down. I'm not picking on you, brother. And, and, and this illustration came up a whole lot earlier than, than that situation there did. But when I put my trust in Jesus, he's not going to let me down. He's not going to crumple and fall over when I put my trust in him. I believe it. Even the, you know, the thing is, even the demons believe in who Jesus is. Even the demons believe that, he, you know, that he's the son of God. But they don't act on it. They don't put their trust and their confidence in that fact. John says our faith, our trust in who God says Jesus is makes us overcome, gives us our victory. I think the biblical definition of faith that not only applies to our salvation, it's applicable to every other part of our Christian life. We are to believe what the Bible says. We are to obey it. We are to believe the promises of God. We are to live our lives according to those promises. We are to agree with the truth of God's Word. We are allowed to allow ourselves to be transformed by it. Because if we don't have faith, then we are what? Without faith. And the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, just a few verses after that, telling us what faith is. He says, it's impossible to please God. If you don't have faith, it's impossible to please God. You will never be pleasing to Him. He says also, John also says, in John 3, 16, remember what that one says? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever 
believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John chapter 10 verse 10, he talks about Jesus saying, I have come that they may have life and have it to its fullest, have it to an abundance. If we don't have faith, we will never have an abundant life. If we don't have faith, we will never be able to be saved. If we don't have faith, it's impossible for us to please God. John is saying, my brothers, my sisters, my dear children, make certain that your faith is in God. Through Christ, we're able to shift our affections away from the world. We're able to overcome sin. We're able to overcome Satan. We can be victorious over temptation through our faith in Jesus and what he's done for us. Those of us who fight addictions on a daily basis understand that that victory that we achieve, today I didn't drink, today I didn't curse, today I didn't lust, today I didn't do something because I'm addicted to all those things. The days that I don't do that... The days that I don't give in to those things are victorious days, days of victory. But I didn't win it on my own. I gained that victory through Jesus Christ. Back in chapter 1, John says, I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. John is encouraging his listeners. John's encouraging us almost 2,000 years later. Your faith has helped you become victorious. You are a conqueror. You have conquered this world. And conquering isn't just saying, you know what, I'm going to do better. That, that's, a, that's a part of it. Wanting to do better, that's a part of it. It's not just saying that. It's not just saying, well, you know what, tomorrow I'm going to try harder. That's a part of it. But it's not just saying, not paying lip service to those things. I think a lot of times we don't overcome because we're trying to do it on our own. And I have not seen only just a handful of times when people went up against the devil face to face that they came out on the side of victory. Jesus showed us how to do that, turn to God's word. But time and again, people are faced with the devil and time and again people try to do it on their own and they fail but our victory our victory comes through our faith our trust our belief in who Jesus is and then John moves on to the last part and this may be one of the most controversial parts or mis misunderstood parts in all of 1 John, he talks about the testimony concerning the Son. We don't have another six hours to go through everything that's here, so we'll try to wrap this up in the next six minutes. So, This is the one who came by water and blood. He's talking about Jesus, the Son of God, back in verse 5. Jesus, the Son of God, is the one who came by water. Jesus, the Messiah. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. It, and it is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. Now, if you've got a King James Version, I don't know many of us who have that anymore. There's a lot of extra words in there. It says, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Verse 8 would say, and then there are, there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree in one. Now, most scholars kind of put a parenthetical statement on that. Whoever was transcribing that kind of put his own little uh, uh, expository sermon in there on that, or explanation. He was writing a commentary within those lines. It reads literally how I read earlier. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood, and it is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, in verse 8, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and all three are in agreement. Now, we take a great deal of testimony, don't we? We, we, we make a big deal out of testimony. I mean, here we are some 2,000 years removed from any of the events that were written here in the first century. 
And we take it, we, we take it for truth, don't we? We are relying on their testimony. John will even say, I testify, I testify a couple of times in here. The apostles testify, the Word testifies, the Holy Spirit testifies. They are telling us the stories that happen. We take it on their testimony. We rely on their testimony. And when you're relying on testimony, and Kirk knows this, you have a witness list. People that you're going to call to testify for you. He says the water testifies about who Jesus is, the blood testifies about who Jesus is, and the Spirit testifies about who Jesus is. Now the water, and here's where a lot of the scholars don't really have a, a, a consensus on this. It could be the water of his birth, the water of the womb. The, the, the water of the womb testifies that he was born, the Son of God was born to a woman. And then when they talk about the blood, the blood would testify that would be his crucifixion. The blood that was spilled would be his crucifixion. That the Son of God bled and died. And then the Spirit testifying would be what the Spirit has done through John, through Paul, through James, through the other apostles, through the other people. That God speaks through them. The Holy Spirit speaks through them and testifies as to who He is. Now, I like that it... It talks about, if it is talking about his uh, birth and it is talking about his death, I think what the, what, what's being conveyed there is that the Son of God was man. He was human. He was completely human. Because you see, if you remember what John's combating, they're saying, no, this Son of God is a character that came from heaven. When Jesus was baptized, which is another thing that they, this water could be talking about, that when Jesus was baptized, if you remember, the heavens opened up. The Holy Spirit of God descended on him like a dove. God spoke from heaven, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. They're testifying about who Jesus is. That he is completely a human being. That he came to earth. That God himself took the form of a man. That he came to earth that he bled and died to take the sins away. That he was that, that sacrificial lamb. And the Spirit continues to testify about all these things. And John says, we, we, we saw this. These are things that we have seen. We, we've seen it with our own eyes. Remember back what he says at the beginning of his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Verse 14, the Word became flesh. This that was from the beginning with God and was God. God became flesh, made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory the glory of the one and only Son come from the Father. Remember how he starts this epistle. Over in chapter 1 of this epistle, he says, That which from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it. We testify to it. He is giving his testimony. The water gives the testimony about who Jesus is. The blood gives the testimony about who Jesus is. The Spirit gives the testimony about who Jesus is. And they're all in agreement. It's not like the Spirit and the water and the blood. Well, he's this guy. No, he's that guy. No, he's no. they're all saying he's the same person. He is the Son of God. But I want you to look at the next witness on, on, the, on call here. He is the be-all and end-all witness. If no one else ever said anything about who Jesus was, God said it. There was a bumper sticker uh, a preacher friend of mine told me about. He said, it, it says, if God said it, uh, I believe it, that settles it. He's got too many lines in there. If I believe it. No, it should read, God said it, that settles it. That's what John is saying here. Yes, the Spirit and the water and the blood are all testifying as to the, the, who the Son of God is. But God is the one who said it. And he says, if you believe, it, it, when you believe that, your belief in what God has said, that makes you a child of God. You are born again. 
You can become born again when you believe that. And those who don't believe that, what does it say? Make God out to be a what? A liar. Man. I think we may all know some people in our life who have been drastically hurt. Who may have shaken their fists at God and called him a liar out of their pain, out of their misery, out of their agony. God, you said if I followed you, it would be this way. God, you said it would be this and this and this. And I am experiencing none of those things. And that very well may be the case. But I know there's some other passages in here that says <laughs> that say in this life you will have trouble. You will. And then he finishes that up, but take heart. Because I have overcome the world. Jesus has conquered the world. Jesus has conquered all the sinful nature of the world. He's conquered all the problems of the world. He's conquered, uh, he's conquered uh, uh, depression. He's conquered anxiety. He's conquered hunger. He's conquered murder. He's conquered lust and greed. He's conquered all of those things. He's conquered all of our sin. He's conquered all of our, our shortcomings, all of our misgivings, all of our doubt, all of our fear. He's conquered those things. And God says through his apostles, through his word, that when we trust that we become conquerors. We are victorious. We have overcome that part of the world. God never said it was going to be easy. As a matter of fact, you, you guys know that. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. God never said it would be easy. But he says if you follow me, if you trust me, if you put your faith in me, you are born again. You will follow what I say do. Love me. Love your neighbor. I like how John wraps up this particular thought. He says this. This is the testimony. Here's again, God, the be all and end all witness testifying. God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. Whoever has the Son has life, and whoever does not have the Son does not have life. Why would John write this epistle, and why would John preach the same sermon over and over and over and over again to build us up, to give us the strength, to give us the courage that it needs to overcome the world, to continue to overcome the world? Because the last time I checked and the last time we've talked about this, our salvation is not just a one point in time that every, that event happened there and then moving forward, we're just, it's just a matter of time till we get there. We are saved and each and every day brings its own struggles. Each and every day has its own problems. And I may, I may, I may lose today. I may lose my battle to whatever addiction I have today. If I hold on to him, I'm victorious. If I love him the way that I'm supposed to, I'm victorious. I am born again in spite of my shortcomings, in spite of my failures, in spite of my sin. Remember back at the beginning of 1 John, the blood of God, the blood of Christ continually cleanses us. And I may fail today, and I may fail tomorrow, and I may fail the day after that. Because God knows I failed today. And he knows I failed yesterday. And he knows I failed the day before that. And he knows that I'll probably fail again tomorrow. But I continue to look to him. I continue to trust him to know that my salvation doesn't come from me. My salvation comes from him. My salvation comes from the Lord. My salvation comes from Jesus Christ. It comes through Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Messiah, I believe the testimony of God. 
I love it when people teach classes. I love it when I read books. I love it when I read the Bible and I understand and, and learn more things. But what I love the most is that when God tells me something, I can count on it. I can trust it. That's what John is telling these people here. Forget all the people whispering in your ear, pulling you away. You trust in God. And you will be, continue to be, conquerors. I believe Mike has a good song for us today. Every song's a good song, Mike. I don't know why I particularly... Every song's a good song. Any song that brings glory to our God, our Father, is a good song. But I believe he's, he's paid special attention to one that I asked him to. It's called Faith is the Victory. Is that correct? John tells us our faith gives us victory. Our trust, our belief in who God is, what he has done, that he is, he is who he says he is, he's able to do what he says he's able to do. And that is save us from ourselves, save us from our sins, and help us to overcome this world. Our faith, John tells us, is our victory. Because we have victory, we are conquerors. If you have a need to respond to God's message this morning, not mine, but his word, I want you to do so as we stand and sing. Faith is the victory. <laughs>